Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. The sheriff says it's a tragedy that could have been prevented. A mother and her two young sons found dead from the cold. And tonight we are learning devastating new details into what went so wrong. Off the top here at 5, Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard says that mother's family tried to get her help, but she didn't get it. Their worst fears were realized when that mother and her two sons were found dead in a vacant field in Pontiac. Rod Maloney following this story tonight, and you just got an update uh, on the investigation this late this afternoon, Rod. Yeah, Devin, it, it's so, so tragic out here. Now, this is the area of the woods of an old housing project, and well back inside there, about a half a mile back, is where the bodies were found in a field. Now, overnight, the mother and three children, two sons and a daughter, were in that field. It was cold. The daughter woke up, found that she was going to be okay, at least to a point, and walked over to that house, the white house over here on the right, and knocked on the door Sunday morning saying she needed help. And that's when the Sheriff's Department arrived. Sky 4 today, flying over the old Lakeside Projects property. The building's long gone, but its remaining roadways overgrown, as are the grounds. It is here where 35-year-old Monica Kennedy, her two sons, 3-year-old Malik and 9-year-old Kyle, died in their sleep of hyperthermia. Sheriff Mike Bouchard says Monica had somehow decided people were out to kill her, including sheriff's deputies. And she left her apartment only a mile away from here on foot with the three children looking for safety. Over the course of a couple days, we actually had been getting calls about uh, a woman and kids not dressed appropriately for the conditions. Deputies would go there, look all through the area and couldn't find anybody. Uh, we later learned from the surviving daughter that she had told her kids any time anybody approached to run. They found themselves in this neighborhood off of Branch Street. Neighbor Charles Witherspoon saw police activity yesterday and spoke with a neighbor who had spoken with the family on Saturday. They was hungry. I said, well, Doc, uh, what you do? Well, she said, I, I, I didn't let him in, but her brother, Arthur, he, she said he tried to give the young lady some money, and she wouldn't accept it. They wound up in this field near an abandoned old SUV at the edge of Crystal Lake. They were in the field. Um, she told the kids to lay down and sleep, and unfortunately that's where they perished. Now, this is tragedy upon tragedy because we come to find out the husband and father of these children was shot and killed in a Pontiac party about two years ago. The trial is apparently ongoing. It would appear that that trial may have had some severe impact on Monica to bring her children here. Back to you. It's just horrendous, Rod. What, do we, what are the services available to desperate parents like Monica? Well, it turns out that there are ample services, although perhaps not to the level that many people would want to have, but there were plenty of services for her. We're going to take a closer look at all of that coming up on Local 4 News at 6. Important. All right, Rod, we will see you then. Our other top story, though, here at 5, Detroit police opened fire on an armed man at a gas station. It happened at the Sitco station at 8 Mile and Berg Road this morning, and police say the whole thing was caught on green light cameras. Sean Lay is on this story for us, and Sean, I understand people inside that gas station called 911 right away. Absolutely, and giving police a play-by-play -play of everything that went down. I can also show you these doors were shot out, glass already replaced. If you look inside, the uh, ice cream freezer there, it was shot up, already been replaced. You see the big screens here, green light cameras. Police can review all of this footage. This entire situation, dangerous for everyone. When a man walked in here with a gun, turned around and locked the door behind him. 7.20 this morning, a man walks into this sick go at 8 Mile and Berg. He locks the door behind him and starts waving a gun around. Police radio traffic highlights this dangerous situation. He just pointed that firearm at the person that came to the door. That gun pointed at customers who were outside. Detroit police arrive. Police say the man pointed the gun at them. He actually fired a shot. He's firing shot. Shots fired, shots fired. Shots fired. That man is shot by Detroit police. You can see the shattered front door and shattered coolers in the back. Rhonda Jackson was nearby and saw it all go down.
I could have been going into this gas station. I could have been walking up the, the, uh, the block or whatever, and I would have been in the midst of that. He was heavily armed. He had an extended clip magazine on his person with a weapon, and he also had two additional clips. Here's what we're learning about the gunman from Detroit Police Chief James White. It appears that he points the weapon at the officer at some point. Officer is yelling, and you can hear the officer yelling, drop the weapon, drop the weapon, and the officer fires multiple shots. Local 4 crime and safety expert Darnell Blackburn explains why that officer opened fire at that moment. If that gun is raised at them, they are justified in being able to fire their weapon to unfortunately eliminate the threat of anybody getting hurt themselves or anybody. Back here live again, police shoot the man. He was rushed to the hospital, rushed into surgery. We're told he's in critical condition right now. Devin Kimberly. And, and Sean, you, you spoke with the clerk too. What did he have to tell you? He was the only one inside at the time when the man walked in and uh, locked the door. So if you see the protective glass there, he was very, very calm on the line with police the whole time describing everything that he was watching and perhaps they were watching on green light cameras. Right. Very calm when I spoke to him also. A good thing that uh, no one else got hurt. In, indeed, for sure. Okay, Sean, we appreciate it. Well, today is a day of service in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Detroit's MLK Day Committee called for a citywide mobilization to recognize the civil rights hero. There was a rally, a march, and a meal this afternoon at the St. Matthew's St. Joseph Episcopal Church on Detroit's west side. Today's speakers, part of social movements that were taking place around the U.S., all across the country, events being held to honor the life and legacy of Dr. King. Take a look at live pictures from Washington, D.C. and the Martin Luther King Memorial. People have been gathering there all day long, and meanwhile, back here at home in Southfield, a huge turnout at an event that's gone on for close to 40 years. Our Kim DeGiulio was there. Well, it may be called the MLK Peace Walk, but it certainly isn't a quiet one. You can see the community of Southfield coming together, sharing love, sharing joy, and spreading the message of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Hope United Methodist Church was packed with community service groups, sororities, fraternities, and community members before heading out for the city's annual Peace Walk that takes place every MLK Day. We got a whole bunch of different like junior, like high school age organizations. We're going to be mingling with them, I guess, talking to each other and having fun. Oakland County Executive David Coulter was in attendance addressing this lively crowd that is finally back to doing this walk in person for the first time since the pandemic. Southfield does it right when it comes to Martin Luther King Day, and I think they do it the way the Dr. King would want him to do, which is don't just sit around and make a holiday out of it. Get up, march, work, volunteer, uh, and make your voices heard. The walk kicked off at the church, making its way toward the Southfield Pavilion, a full mile to unite as one, just as Dr. King had dreamt of. It's not just a day off of school. It's really just a day to remember what Dr. King did for us. He paved the way, and now, you know, we can all live together peacefully. And it was the age range that stood out to me. Some of these walkers were alive to hear the message of Martin Luther King Jr., while others have only read about it. But it's events like this that keep his dream alive. I learned about Martin Luther King in like elementary school through programs like this. So we'll have to teach them the same thing. They'll be walking with us, so I guess we'll just take them under our wing. You can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. And we just want to make sure our youth know the story of Dr. King and his legacy, and that we continue his nonviolent traditions. And after this, these walkers are headed to the Southfield Civic Center, where they will gather and enjoy food from local Southfield restaurants, and also talk about the legacy and remember Dr. King. Reporting in Southfield, I'm Kim DeGiulio, Local 4.